while since the beginning of the year 2015 is the year to build is what we believe and we are in a series at the moment just for the last few weeks about building the church and we've got to realize that the church is not just some big building the church is each one of us people and that God is building his church that's his vision that's his plan so God is building you God is building me. God is building each one of us. And He's actively doing it right now. And even the fact that you've chosen to come along on a Sunday morning and and take some time to listen to the Word of God and spend some time singing and worshipping the King, God is able to even in a greater way get into our lives and start to activate and build strength for the future. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit today. So God wants to build the church and each one of us are the church. And uh, so here's the verse that we've been using, Psalm 92, verses 13 and 14. Planted in the house of the Lord, they shall flourish in the courts of our God. The word flourish means to overflow with good things. And it also goes on in verse 14, growing in grace. That is the power to do what you cannot do alone. That's in God's power. Growing in grace, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age they shall be full of sap not sappy sap but a sap that is spiritually vitally alive or spiritual vitality and rich in the verdure which verdure which is greenness or lushness of green fruit uh, and trees the verdure of trust love and contentment who would love to be content where you are I I like to be content. I I like to sit in front of a bowl of ice cream and feel so content. I like to be riding along on my motorcycle on the highway feeling so content. I like being in my lover's arms feeling so content. And I, what, my wife, not my lover, my wife, my wife. And I love being in her arms and feeling content. This is my wife, by the way, Pastor Carmen. And so in 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 the passage, the will of God is so clear to each one of us. It's clearly stated that each one of us would flourish by being planted in God's church, the house of God, the church. And the Bible shows that the way to flourish as a believer is to be planted in God's house, in His church, to be committed, to be settled, to be planted. And the Bible does tell us, as I said before, that those who are planted in the house shall flourish. They shall bear fruit. They shall be fresh and flourishing. That means their lives go on to newer and greater things all the time. God is always working to grow us and working to encourage and move through us. And so we become that vessel when we get planted in the church. So we must be planted. The word planted conveys an image of stationary, not stagnation, but solid. Con- con- concrete foundational strength when you're stable in all situations you're not flipping and flowing here and there you're planted and you're flourishing and you're growing that's what the word planted means and you're committed to a local church you open your life to many benefits promised in the bible so today we want to share with you some of the things that we receive as benefits for being planted in the local church So point number one, one of the things that we receive as a benefit for being planted in the local church is an atmosphere that draws you nearer to God. When I was at Bible college many, many years ago, I I was planted in my local church and I was getting more passionate for God and more excited about His purposes and I wanted to do more. So I went off to Bible college and I remember sitting in my first class and a lady walked in and it was actually the pastor of the church. He, the pastor and his wife were senior pastors together. They were in co-ministry, man and wife. And she walked into the Bible college room. And as we're sitting there getting this lecture, as she started to speak, I could just feel the atmosphere of the room shift and change. Such peace and security came around us. And it's an, an anointing or a presence of God that she carried on her life. And right from that point, I realize that that each minister in the body of Christ is a gift to people in the body of Christ. It talks about that the church has been given gifts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers for the equipping of the church. And there is a gift on our lives and other ministers' lives that we've invited in and leaders in this church to equip each one of us for our destiny and our purpose where we are in life. So God's trying to build us. So that's one of the benefits. It draws us closer to God. 
And I got planted. I did everything that God wanted me to do because I wanted to go forward. I didn't want to be stagnant. I wanted to be stable, but I wanted to move. And so God's purpose for the local church is to stir each one of us to grow closer to Him. You look at everything we do in the local church, every single avenue of growth or every different venue or thing that we do during the week, small groups, moms out, and husbands, men, whatever we're doing, and Sunday services, the different things we do during the services, it's all about, number one, drawing us closer to God. When the men go out on their ride in a few weeks' time after church, and by the way, ladies, if you've got a motorbike, you're quite welcome to come along. We're all going to be riding together. It's going to be so good. But the main purpose of that is getting us closer to God, closer to each other, enjoying the wind, enjoying the muscle and the motorbikes, <laughs> some of the horsepower, but enjoying God. It says in James chapter 4, verse 8, listen, it's very important for the church to want us to draw us closer to Him. It says in James 4, verse 8, Come close to God, and He will come close to you. Do you understand during the week, there's times when we're we're not always in church, and we're not meant to always be in church because we are the church. It's not that we have to come to a building, you know, every single moment of the day, but we come at certain times on a a weekend or maybe midweek to get refreshed and reestablished, but we are the church. God is building us every day of the week. He's building us all the time in our personal relationship. We've got to understand there are times during the week that we're drawn away from God. We're drawn away because we're not, you know, we're not meeting together. We're not with the the group of believers in encouraging each other. There's certain things that that draw us off track. So this verse goes on to say this little bit of corrective information. And if you're ready for it, I'll just share it with you. It says, come close to God and He will come close to you. Recognize that you are sinners. The word sinners just means imperfect. So if you're perfect, put up your hand. Okay, there's a few Jesuses in the building. That's okay. But if you're imperfect, that means you're a human. And you're just like, you're just like me. And uh, that means we need a Savior. We need His purpose, His plan. And so His perfection. Yes, we are perfect on the inside, born again spirit. That's great. And so recognize that we are sinners. Get your soily hands clean. Soiled hands clean. Realize that you have been disloyal. Oh, disloyal to who? God possibly. And he goes on to say this, wavering individuals and divided interests and purity, purify your hearts of your spiritual adultery. And it's, that sounds pretty harsh and direct, but really what he's saying here is, come on, get your life back on track. Let's just get back on focus. Our one true focus is our loving God. And yes, this outflows in many areas of our lives, our loving relationship with our wife, being a great dad, being great in business or amazing at work and having favor with everyone around you. That all flows out of our relationship with God. And so church is all about bringing us back into that place of being on track. And so Billy Graham said this one time when he had a whole group of people that he led to God. At the end of a crusade, he would say this every crusade after they said the prayer, received Jesus in their heart, and became a born-again believer. The next step was this. He said, this is how you get closer to God every day. These five steps, follow these, and you'll have a great life. He says to pray and read your Bible every day. That's step number one. Step number two, get planted in a Bible-believing church. Step number three, give and serve in that Bible-believing church. Be a giver, be a servant, not just an attender. Then he said worship and obey God every day. And the last one was share your faith freely. It doesn't mean to wear a sandwich board and go around being a a crazy guy. But what it does mean is to be there, to be someone who pulls someone out of the ditch when when they've had a bad driving day or, or someone that's just there to help out a friend. And then you have answers when they have questions. So these are some things that can grow us. Church is, the word means to be a called out, joined together company. So Billy Graham didn't just get people saved. He saw that they were planted in a local church because we're called out and we're joined together as a company with a vision and a purpose for future. Everything we do in church is to set us up to have an atmosphere that draws us nearer and closer to God because that's what gives us a better life and an eternal future. So I want to challenge you and encourage you today. Point number one, get planted in a local church and enjoy the benefits of being drawn closer to God.
So as we're planted in the church, we're on a series talking about the purpose of being planted in the church. As we're planted in the church, there are benefits that you should receive. The first one is that you should receive the benefit of an atmosphere that draws you near to God. The second one is you should receive the benefit of a place where your marriage can get on the same page. You know, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You know, there's a lot of comparisons between the way that God loves the church and the way that a marriage is supposed to function, the way that a husband is supposed to love his wife. And, you know, I believe it's just so amazing when you're planted in church and you come and you sit under the word of God together and you sit under the, you worship together and you sit under the presence of God together, you begin to grow together. And God is pro-marriage. God wants your marriage to flourish and be strong and get stronger and stronger and stronger every step of the way. And as you're planted in the house, you give God that ability to work through you. And I remember when we were first married, we would seem to always fight on a Sunday morning. And if you're, if you're married this morning and you've ever had a fight on a Sunday morning, welcome to the club. Welcome to the group. And so, you know, all week we'd be doing okay, but Sunday morning the cat was out of the bag. I don't know what happened, but we began to fight on Sunday mornings. And I remember I began to share this with a couple other married couples in the church that we were planted in. And they said, you know, it's the same thing with us. We always fight on Sunday mornings. And I began to realize that the enemy has a strategy against marriages. He doesn't want you to worship together. He doesn't want you to sit under the word and be changed and transformed as a couple together. And so we'd made a decision. We were planted in the house of God. And the first strategy of the enemy when you're fighting on Saturday, Sunday morning is the enemy will say, do not go to church with that person. I remember just feeling like I am not going to church with you. I don't even want to see you. I don't want to look at you. I don't want to be near you. But we made a decision. We were planted in the house of God. And so that meant that we went to church whether we were fighting or not. And so we just simply decided we'd take separate vehicles. And so if, you know, if anyone ever seen us roll up to church on a Sunday morning in two vehicles, they knew that we'd had a good scrap before we came. But we were planted in the house of God. And as we were planted, you know, something would happen in the worship when God would begin to soften our heart. And something would happen in the word. And we felt like somebody had read our mail that morning and was talking straight to us and we would come out of there where we had grown together can I encourage you there is something powerful about being planted and making a decision you know doesn't matter if we're fighting doesn't matter if the cat peed on the on the carpet doesn't matter if I woke up with a scratchy throat I am planted in the house and I will rise and go and worship the king of kings and the lord of lords number three what's one of the benefits of being planted you will have an opportunity to be trained 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8 says, For physical training is of some value. It's useful for a little. But godliness, spiritual training, is useful and of value in everything and in every way. For this present life and in the life to come. This morning I was driving to church, and as we were driving to church, there was many people who were riding bicycles on a particular um, uh, uh, different outing that they were on, and so, you know, they were stopping us, and we had to yield and let them go, and there was hundreds and hundreds of them going, and I thought, I have to give credit where credit's due. I thought, in the shape I am, there is no way that I could do one lap around that highway. Never mind, they kept going over and over, and these people were ripped, you know, and they were they were, you know, just doing it. I was like, that is so awesome. They have been trained. And I was talking to some of my kids. I'm like, you don't just get on a bicycle and start riding like that. You have to train and train and train to be prepared for a race like that. And as we were driving, I was watching them. And I thought about this verse. Physical training has some value. But the spiritual training prepares you. It is valuable for everything in every way. 
And I just began to pray for the bicycles. I just began to pray for them. I thought, you know, they might be physically fit, but are they spiritually fit? Are they prepared for their future? Are they prepared for whatever next month, next year might bring into their path? Are they spiritually prepared? And so I started praying for these bicyclers. I started praying that they would know Jesus. I started praying that they would be planted in the house of God where they would flourish. I started praying that they would so be radically conformed to follow Jesus that next year they'd have have to do the race on a Saturday because the bicyclers would say, we aren't racing on Sunday morning. We are going to church. We're sitting under the word. We're going to worship God. And I began to pray for them because I thought physical training has some value and we should do it. To the person beside you said, you should get a little more fit. Come on, that's a good challenge. You get a little more fit. But spiritual training has value in everything, in every way. We are prepared for anything when we are spiritually trained. Anything that comes up against us, any opportunity that God brings our way, we are prepared in advance because we are spiritually fit. Number four, as you're planted in the house of God, what are some of the benefits you should receive? You should receive a place of community. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 says the believers form a community. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Do you know a community of believers, it gives us a sense of belonging. And, you know, it's unfortunate when people have had that negative experience where, you know, they went to church and they were kind of pushed aside or they weren't welcomed and they didn't get that sense of community because God wants us to be planted in the house of God where we belong to an extended family, where we are planted and we belong. And I was thinking about this church and whenever we travel and we're speaking at different places, I always brag about you. I always tell people how good you are and how awesome you are. And you know, there's a lot of churches I can tell you I would not want to be the pastor of that church. But I am proud to be the pastor of you people because you are not a judgmental church. You know, there is something about you that you love people with a genuine love. And you know, people can come in with all different kinds of backgrounds and situations from their past. And there is a non judgmental attitude. You simply allow people to come in the way they are. The other thing I I love about you is you are not hypocrites. You know, you don't put on a different face to come to church and act a certain way. You are who you are, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, but you are a real person, you know, and so you are the kind of person that you're not trying to fake it. You are a real person who's serving Jesus, who's growing, who's developing, and I love that about you. The other thing I love about you is that you are not perfect, and because you are not perfect, Anyone can fit here. Because you don't have that pious attitude of, I'm holy, perfect, this and that. Because you are not perfect, anyone can belong to this community of faith. And, you know, as we are planted in the house of God and we choose to get involved, we choose to come to a small group where we can be in smaller settings and get to know people. We choose to allow ourselves to pray with people and get to know other people and pray for them and allow them to pray for us. Something happens and we are built strong and we flourish because we are in the community of faith. And I love being in a small group with someone who might be a little bit new and they say, I've never prayed out loud for anyone ever before. And I said, you know what? When you pray, you just talk to God the way you talk. God isn't looking for a special kind of language. He isn't looking for it to be done a special kind of way. He just wants you to just talk to him from your heart. And you watch this person begin to pray out loud and pray for another believer's life. Pray for something that's going on in their life. Pray for a situation to be turned around. And you just see that sweetness of the community of faith. As you are planted in the house of God, God gives you an extended family. And there's an old saying that says, blood is thicker than water. That simply means, you know, natural family is stronger than friendship. But I believe the blood of Jesus is thicker than anything. It stands through the test of time. It stands through the circumstances. Who do you want to call when all of a sudden you know someone who might be facing a sickness or has a situation going? You want another believer to stand with you in faith on the word of God and agree with you that our God is greater. 
And so there is something powerful I'll be part of a community of faith. There's an African proverb, and it says this. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. As we go together, we go further. As we go together, we grow. It's part of being planted. Number five this morning, the last one. As you are planted in the house of God, what are some of the benefits that you should receive? You should receive a challenge. Turn to the person beside you this morning and say, I like a good challenge. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 21 says, I challenge you in front of God, Jesus, his anointed, and his select heavenly messengers to keep these instructions. Do you know, we should receive a challenge when we are planted in the house of God. Do you know it's a challenge that will grow you? It's a challenge that will stretch you. It's a challenge that will make you better, that will make you stronger, that will push you to the limits, and you'll find out that there is more in you than what you thought. A challenge is powerful. And when we are planted in the house of God, we should receive a challenge. Joshua said this in Joshua chapter 23. Joshua challenged Israel to be faithful. He said, be very strong, careful to obey all that is written in the law, scroll of Moses, so that you won't swerve from the left to the left or to the right. But you must be loyal to the Lord your God, as you have been to this very day. One of you makes a thousand run away. For the Lord your God fights for you as he promised he would. Watch yourself carefully and love the Lord your God. You know, Joshua gave this challenge. He kind of took his boys aside and he was like, okay, boys, I got a challenge for you. And here's the challenge. I want to challenge you to obey the word of God. I want to challenge you to take that word of God and let it be your anchor. Let it be the thing that guides you. Let it be your stronghold. Let it be your light of your path. I want to challenge you to let that word of God lead you. And he said, if you will let that word of God lead you and you will let it challenge you and you will let it grow you and you will let it shape you, he said, you will take a thousand men down. There will be a strength and a victory that will come over your life that is supernatural. And so he was talking to his boys and he was challenging them. And I was thinking about this as we are planted in the house of God, we should receive a challenge. Do you know when you hear a message, it should either make you glad and excited because it should be, that's exactly what God's been speaking to me about this week already. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit's been talking to me about. And so then you're excited and you're glad because you realize, look at this is, this is God. He's talking to me about this. It should make you glad or it should make you mad. There should be a challenge that you think, you know, oh, you know, I just hate hearing that same thing over and over again. Maybe, you know, you come and you say, you know, Pastor Steve, he's like a broken record. He just keeps saying, draw near to God, draw near to God, draw near. I don't want to draw near to God. I don't want to. You know, I want to do my own thing. And he just keeps saying, draw near to God, draw near to God. That's a challenge that you receive. And so, or maybe it's, you know, when I do the giving message, maybe you just want to go to the bathroom. You're like, I don't want to hear about tithing. I don't want to hear about giving offerings. I I don't want to hear about God's financial plan for my life. I want to go to the bathroom and come back in at the end of it. You know, that's a good thing because you're being challenged out of your comfort zone to learn what God has for you and God's way and God's will according to his word. But you should receive a challenge. And a challenge is a great thing. You know, this week, I went ziplining. And I had been ziplining one other time. I happened to, I can tell you, I do not like ziplining, personally. But a few years ago, I went ziplining, and it's been a few years, and I thought, you know what? You know how you feel like you've conquered that fear, but you can look up at a zipline and go, nope, the fear's back. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to go ziplining. And so I got on this zipline, and, you know, they're pulling up the harness further and further. If you're a guy, I feel really sorry for you. But uh, so they're really yanking and yanking and tying you in this thing. And so the lady said, okay, you know, you're at the edge. She's got me all strapped in, and she's like, you're going to jump off. And I didn't want to burst her bubble, but I turned her and said, I can tell you right now, I am not going to jump off. You know, if you're waiting for me to jump, we are going to be here all day because I don't feel I have what it's going to take to jump off. And so I said, what we're going to do is you are going to push me. 
And uh, I said, I don't know if this goes against your regulations, against your rules, but you are going to shove me off because that is the only way I'm going to get off. And she began to tell me about there was a lady. It took her 45 minutes to get off. I said, I don't want that to be me. I want this to be quick. You know, and I, I band-aid, rip it off. It's painful, but it's quick, right? And so I want this to be quick. So I said, you know, I want you to count to three. Or I said, count to three and push me off. Give me a shove and away I'll go. So I'm standing with my eyes closed and, you know, the belt is pulling me and she's not doing anything. So I turn around. I said, you know, why haven't you pushed me yet? And she said, oh, I thought you were going to count to three. I'm like, I'm not counting to three. You count to three and then just shove me off, you know. So then she was like, one, two, three, and she gave me a big push. Of course, I screamed hysterically, and down the zip line I went, and, you know, then I was kind of dangling there because I couldn't get myself down, and, but there was something to me that I wanted a challenge. I wanted to make sure that I have overcome the fear of heights. I like to challenge myself and do something different so that I can make sure I'm not afraid of heights. Do you know, God wants to challenge you. He wants to challenge your life to make sure that fear is not dominating you. Fear is not leading you. Fear is not controlling you. He wants you challenged so that you can be bold and strong and courageous and fulfill that great purpose that he placed on your life, that great destiny that he has placed on your life. And so God wants us to receive a challenge when we come into the house of God, when we come in and we're planted in his house. He wants us to receive a challenge. And, you know, as, as new believers, we receive the challenge easy. But as you get to be older as a Christian, sometimes it can get more difficult to receive the challenge. Sometimes you can think, I've heard this message before. I heard this scripture before. I heard that story before. I've heard this before. Can I tell you the problem is when you've heard it and you're not living it. That's the problem. And so as older believers, we have to make sure that we're not just saying, I've heard this before. We're saying, I am living the challenge. Do you know what? As an older believer, we have to make sure we don't lose the principles and the disciplines of the Christian walk, that we don't become so, you know, easy going with things that we forget to honor God's word. Joshua said, if you will follow the word of God, you will become strong and victorious and you can take on the enemy up to a thousand as one man. As an older Christian, make sure that you're still putting into practice those same disciplines, those same principles of God, that you're still working them into your life, that you're not getting lazy, that you're not pushing into the side, that you're not beginning to say, I can do this thing by myself. I don't need to spend time with God. I don't need to read the word every day. I don't need to draw near to God. I can do this thing myself. I can handle this business myself. I can handle this marriage myself. I can handle this family myself. Because you know what? We've all found out we cannot. We must have God as the center of our life, or life begins to crumble around us. I want to encourage you, as you are planted in the house of God, receive the challenge of God. And this morning, I believe the challenge for you is draw near to God. He's already waiting. He says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. He doesn't say, you know, draw near to me, and if I'm not too busy, with the millions of children I have around the world, I might have time for you. No, he says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. I believe this morning we can receive that challenge this morning and say, God, I'm going to draw near again to you. Close your eyes for a moment today. I want to pray with you. If you're watching with us online, we're going to pray in just a moment, and I want to encourage you that we're going to take a moment to draw near to God. And as we do, I challenge you to allow your heart to be soft and tender to God and that you too will draw near to God at this moment when you're watching. So this morning I want to ask, if you're in this place today, maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. You're in a place where you've just simply never said, Jesus, I need you as the leader of my life. Or maybe you're in a place this morning where you say, you know, I've prayed that prayer. I've given my life to God. But I know in the last month, maybe the last week, maybe it's the last two days, I have not drawn near to God. I've kind of been doing the Lone Ranger style. It's like, it's just me. I can face life by myself. But I recognize the challenge this morning that I need to draw near to God every day. So this morning, if you're in this place and you haven't never given your life to Jesus, or you're in this place and you say, you know what, it's been 
a little while. There's been a portion of time that I've been Lone Ranger in it. Maybe only a few days, but today I recognize I need to draw near to God. And you want to make that commitment to him that you, you pre-decide, this week, God, I'm drawing near. This week, God, I'm going to press into your presence. This week, God, I'm going to read your word. This week, God, I'm going to put you first. I receive the challenge. If that's you this morning, slip up your hand with no one looking around. I want to pray with you today. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Place your hands down. Thank you. Anybody else today? You received the challenge to draw near to God. I want to encourage you to pray this prayer with me today and say, Jesus, thank you that you died on the cross for me. You are a good God. Today, I make a decision to make you the leader of my life. I choose this day who I will serve, and I choose to serve you, Jesus. Today, I make a decision to draw near to you. I turn my heart towards you right now, God, and I draw near. I make a decision that this week, I will seek you, God. This week, I will read your word. This week, I'm going to draw near. And I thank you that when I draw near, you always come near to me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching today. If you'd like to partner with us, or if you'd like more information about Global Connections Church, such as service times, or to check out what we're doing in our community and internationally, please visit us at www.greatchurch.ca. This morning, I have a few moments for your tithing offering message. During this time, I always take this few moments to teach you about the purpose of giving. So that we know why we give and we understand what the Bible has to say about our giving so that when we activate this and we actually are a giver, that we also do it by faith in the Word of God. And so this morning, I want to talk about a man named Abraham. And so we happen to know Abraham in the Bible, that he was very blessed and that he was a friend of God and that God tremendously, tremendously blessed Abraham. And so we want to look at his life a little bit. In Hebrews chapter 7 verse 2, it says, Abraham gave the tithe of all things. We can go back into Genesis and see how Abraham was always tithing. He would step out and give God and honor God with that tithe. And if you look at John chapter 8, verse 39, we see here that um, people are talking to Jesus. And they said to Jesus, our father is Abraham. And Jesus responded, if you really were Abraham's descendants, you would do what Abraham did. And so Abraham had a life that was obedient to God. He had a life where he honored God and he was ready to do whatever God told him to do. And one of the parts of that is that Abraham was a tither. And so we can see here that the descendants of Abraham, as children of Abraham, that we are to live a life that has the same principles of obeying God and honoring his word as well as being the tither. And so if we are a child of Abraham, the Bible tells us there tells us that there are a lot of promises that belong to us. Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 says, you are his heirs and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Turn to the person beside you and say, it belongs to you. So we understand that if we are a child of Abraham, that we do what Abraham does, that means that we are a tither, we honor God, we choose to obey God. And it says now all the promises that God gave to Abraham belong to to you. And I want to just take you to one of the promises that God gave to Abraham that now belongs to us if we are obeying God, if we're living for God, if we are a tither. Genesis chapter 12 verse 2. God said to Abraham, and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you with abundant increase of favors and I will make your name famous and distinguished and you will be a blessing dispensing good to others. That means that God said, Abraham, I'm going to put my blessing on you. Abraham, I'm going to put my favor on you. Abraham, I'm going to raise you up to be a great nation, and I'm going to make your name famous and distinguished. And Abraham, not only am I going to bless you, I'm going to position you to be a blessing to others. And you will dispense good to others. You will be a vessel that I can flow through to get my blessing to somebody else. How many think that's a pretty good promise for us? And so the Bible tells us here that if we 
live the way Abraham did. We can actually receive this promise on our life. And I want to this morning as tithers, we want to agree as Abraham gave a tithe and we're a tither this morning. We want to agree with this verse that we are going to receive the promises that God made to Abraham. And I love the fact that God didn't just say to Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to think that's pretty good right there. But he didn't just say that. He didn't say, I'm, he didn't just say, I'm going to bless you. He said, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you a blessing. Do you know, when you are a blessing, it's greater than just being blessed. It is the greater. You know, Jesus said it's better to give than it is to receive. Why is it better to give than it is to receive? Because the giver has something to give. And so when, when God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you a blessing to others. He was saying that's the more than enough principle. Not only are you blessed, but now you are in a position to be a vessel dispensing good, dispensing the blessing of God to others. And that's what we want to agree for this morning as we return the tithe. This morning as you sow your offerings, as you give to the poor, you give your first fruits today, I want to encourage you. We want to believe and stand on this promise and receive this on our life as well as on our family this morning. So if your preferred method of giving is debit or credit, you can do so at the back of the auditorium. If you're watching with us online, we encourage you to step into the principles of God of giving and see the blessing of God come on your life. So this morning, I encourage you to place your hand on your envelope and let's agree with the word of God today. Father, first of all, we position ourselves as a tither today. God, we say we choose to be a tither. God, you are a good and gracious God, and every good thing we have comes from you. And so, God, we choose to return the tithe this morning that already belongs to you. And, Father, this morning we choose to sow our offerings, oh, God. We choose to be a giver, God, above our tithes. We choose to be a sower. And, Father, we thank you that you have promises that you have given to Abraham. And you declared in your word that those promises belong to us. So Father, as we stand as a tither, as we stand as a sower this morning, we thank you, God, that your blessing is coming upon our family, oh God. Father, we thank you that we are blessed, but not just blessed, blessed to be a blessing to others. God, that we can be a vessel that you can flow through, dispensing good to others. And Father, we promise we will always give you all the glory and all the honor for the blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give today.